Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Scott Mitchell back with us as we are going to be talking about why he believes aliens are actually fallen angels posing as aliens. What's going on there? We'll check in with Scott in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. A little bit about Scott Mitchell, a mind-opening Bible teacher, host of Bible Mysteries podcast. Scott has been a student of the Bible, Bible history, and biblical mysteries for 40-plus years. His careers have spanned music, legal support, and technology. Scott has pastored a Bible church in Texas, is the founder of the Unlock the Bible Now ministry, and after years of study, Scott found the key to unlocking the secrets in the Bible. Scott began Bible Mysteries podcast, and his utbnow.com website shares the truth about what the world is trying to hide. Scott, welcome back. It's great to be back, George. Good to hear you. I'm looking forward to this, and how have you been? I've been quite well. Uh, last time you and I spoke, I had uh, a, an attack happening <laughs> in a in a hotel room as I was traveling, and uh, this time I, I made sure to pray and armor up so the same attack won't happen again. Was it a demonic attack on you? I do believe so. Uh, you and I had spoken m m several times in the past, and I never had my throat just close up as if somebody grabbed it and, and closed it up, and I, I was struggling to even speak. They did uh, not want you to tell us whatever you were telling us that night. <laughs> I, I firmly believe that, and, and how silly of me not to think about making sure the armor of God was, was surrounding me. I, I, just, I just didn't think about it, and sure enough, uh, yeah, that came through. Scott, before we get into the UFO alien uh, tie-in here, give us your description of fallen angels and what they are. Yeah, so I, I believe that the Bible indicates the angels were created by God in the beginning, and uh, evidently one-third of them joined uh, one particular cherub uh, in, a, in an insurrection against God. This particular cherub is named Lucifer. He wanted to be God. And he drew a third of the angels in, into this rebellion. There was a war, and it practically devastated our solar system. I, I believe the evidence is all around us. Uh, it's, it's possible that the asteroid belt that we see today was a planet called Rahab in the Bible. And the devastation that came from that rained down on Mars and the moon and the Earth. And, uh, but at one point, the Earth was their home. It was his dominion. And then God re stored that planet, granted dominion of the earth to man whom he created much more recently than the angels. And the angels have been angry and they've wanted it back ever since. What made them go astray in the first place? Pride. Uh, th this entity named Lucifer was a cherub that was created the most beautiful uh, created being. Uh, full of the sum of wisdom, perfect in beauty. Every precious stone was his covering according to Ezekiel 28, and uh, that was not enough for him. He wanted more than just to be second fiddle to the Lord himself. He wanted to be, he wanted to receive worship. And he was able to convince these angels to join him in a rebellion, probably by promising them some form of power or dominion themselves if they won the insurrection. And hence we get the phrase, the love of money is the root of all evil. Have they grown in terms of stature or population amongst themselves? I don't believe they have, but it's interesting you bring that up, George, because the angels themselves don't procreate amongst each other. Uh, we know that they violated God's commandment in Genesis 6 when they came down and procreated with human women to create the giants of the Nephilim. So the Nephilim ha had increased their numbers at least up to the time when they were destroyed in the flood of Noah and became the disembodied spirits or demons, as people refer to them. But they'll be, uh, I believe, the, the alien abduction 
uh, hybridization program is increasing their numbers now because the devil knows he's outnumbered uh, two to one in this upcoming battle, and he's creating an army, in my opinion, of hybrid human aliens that are much more they're, – they're the, the Superman or the X-Men you know, of, of our fantasy movies, but they're going to be uh, – they're literally going to war against the God of heaven when he returns. And how, yeah, yes, tell us how, Scott, you tied the alien phenomenon in with the fallen angels then. Well, you know, it kind of starts with the passages in um, in the Bible about the term the chariots of fire. In fact, that's a episode 123 and 124 at BibleMysteriesPodcast.com if anybody wants to check it out. But these are vehicles of conveyance, you know, and, and th- those centuries of the prophets like Elijah – to see something flying across the sky, th- there were no cars or airplanes for them to equate that to. So in the language of their century, they're calling it a chariot of fire because it's the closest vehicle of conveyance that they can compare it to. But in reality, I believe what they were seeing were what we would call UFOs. And this idea that angels – Unfortunately, Christianity is deeply infected with heresies, including Gnosticism today and Christoplatonism. And so we think of angels as these non-corporeal spirit beings, but they're not. They're very much physical and corporeal. They, when they have appeared in the Bible, they appear to look like men. They eat. Uh, they, they can be touched and handled, and they, they, these chariots of fire are drawn by horses of fire according to uh, the Bible and the book of Kings and Samuel, so Second Samuel. So you've got – we've got to change our thinking of, of this Western ideology from the Bible when, in fact, it's, a, it's an Oriental book, and we need to think mm-hmm. of it as a, as a Middle Eastern book, you know, and, and, and with Eastern mentality. And the ancients and the rabbis of, of old, they didn't think of angels as – ghostly apparitions. They knew that they were physical beings that could be touched and held. Scott, are the aliens all fallen angels, or are some of them indeed from other planetary systems? That's the great question, George, that there's debate about. Um, I fall on the on the side of they're not aliens. They're, not, they're extraterrestrial in every sense of the word, uh, because they're not from this planet necessarily, but I think that the Greys, for example, that everybody talks about um, from, say, Roswell, right? They're they are probably host bodies for the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. So I, that's where I come down on it. There's there's other opinions about that, but I believe they are probably carrying out an agenda. I don't think they want to be doing this. Uh, They would rather possess a human body if they could, and they're doing plenty of that too, particularly, in my opinion, in government. Uh, I believe politicians are mostly possessed, and that doesn't mean they're running around spinning their heads and spitting pea soup like the movies, you know. They're following a carefully uh, orchestrated agenda of domination and destruction of civilization because they want to bring about this government of the Antichrist. Now, there's a program underfoot, of course, where we claim the abductions are done by extraterrestrials. You think there's a, another agenda here? I really do, because if you think about the fact that in Genesis 6, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of which they chose, I believe there was an exchange that took place. They, they made a contract with humanity because God gave man dominion of the earth. So there are some rules of engagement they have to play by. And when they came down, they said, hey, give us your wives. We will uh, give you technology. And the exchange took place. Well, when the wives were taken by these entities, these were fallen angels. But the children that were produced by them uh, and the women of earth were hybrids. So these became the giants of the Bible in in the land of Canaan later on after that. But God destroyed the entire planet with a flood because of that. And, you know, the the story of Noah is not the story we learned as little kids, where, you know, two of our kind of animal went in the Mm ark because people were just not nice to each other. No, there was a genetic corruption and manipulation of God's creation of not just humans, but of the animal kingdom. So chimeras and things like that from from lore and mythology are probably true. 
And therefore, God destroyed even the animal kingdom except for the ones that he saved on the ark. What he placed on the ark were the only genetically pure humans and animals that he originally created from their kind, and he saved those but destroyed the rest because they were not fully human. And I believe that um, these became the disembodied spirits, the, the dead Nephilim, the dead giants, and they are probably through their fathers, which are the fallen angels, the ones that remained unchained in hell because they weren't punished yet. They haven't done the, the same things that their brethren did. They're the ones that probably created or somehow manufactured host bodies for them. And that could somehow be an indication of what the greys potentially are. Were they Scott abominations? I, I think they were, weren't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, the, the, uh, that's a great term for it because we don't get this story from the Bible, but there's a, there's a book called the Book of Enoch, which is considered a non-canonical book, but it's historically significant. And it's the only book that, that tells of this story about the Nephilim uh, in, in the details that we get from that. And I give it relevance only because it's actually cited in the Bible, in the book of Jude and, and by Second Peter. But they state that these entities came, and when they fathered the, the offspring, the, these giants took over. The, the legends of the Titans and the, and the Greek gods, all of that ties back to these things. And they practically destroyed and enslaved humanity. In fact, they even ate human beings according to the book of Enoch. Jeez. And so that's why they, men cried out to God for, for relief, and that's why they were destroyed. But these entities, um, because they were not human, they didn't die. I don't think they had souls. They didn't die like men. They died and became these disembodied spirits roaming around seeking a body to inhabit, whether human or animal. What do you think sleep paralysis might be if it's not just a medical term? You know, it's really interesting because it, it, it's dismissed as a medical or psychological thing if you look it up and, and search it on the web. But when you actually research the word like nightmare, it's derived from an old English word mare, which is not the horse, but it's a mythological demon or goblin huh. who torments others with frightening dreams. That's what the actual mare was. And so I... I myself have experienced this, and I'll, I'll share a story with you if you want later. But these um, demonic entities, I believe, are attempting to lure into deception, or it may be that what they're actually experiencing is the abduction uh, phenomenon, and the screen memories that are given to them are all they can recall is maybe a bad dream. Interesting. Now, what about your sleep paralysis experience? What happened to well, you? Yeah, it's interesting because when I was young, but yeah, I didn't grow up in a religious family at all, and we never darkened the door of a church. And I recall having recurring nightmares as a young child, and one of them involved I would be asleep in my own room in my bed, but I, I was awake. It's like I could see my body lying on the bed as if I was outside of my body, and I would watch the body rise up off the bed uh, you know, with, with the covers off, and I started to float down a hallway, a long, dark hallway, which I assume was my house, you know, and it was going in the direction of, I guess, where my parents' bedroom was at the end of the house, but it was just dark and scary, and I would be struggling to wake up, but I couldn't move. You know, you'd be screaming, but you couldn't move, and a very interesting thing happened recently, George, where this recurred a number of times, probably until I was around 13 or 14, and I'm now 60 years old. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was visiting my brother in Nashville, and he's just a few years younger than I am. And we were just having a discussion, and I never talked to him about this and never brought this up to him. We never talked about it. And I asked him if he had ever had any recurring nightmares when he grew up, when he was little. And he described the exact same dream that I had. Only difference was, he said, at the end of a dark hallway where there was some sort of an entity, some kind of an, he didn't describe it as a demon. I don't even think he's really a, a, a believer uh, in, in the faith, but he described it as an entity. And of course, the hair stood up on the back of my neck because we've never discussed this, and yet he had the same thing. And so I started thinking about, could these things be coming through because of something in our ancestry? 
You know, did we have some Masonic great great grandparent or or some occult practice that made a covenant? And, and I began to look into generational or, or a curse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A generational curse. I think like the Kennedys were cursed a long time ago, weren't they? Yeah, I I, I believe that's very possible. If, if we take at, at 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 literal value what. God said in Exodus 20 about visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children, then you can see where that's coming from. I, at that point, not know, you know, I, I can say that I had uh, two sets of grandparents. My maternal grandparents were people of faith. My paternal grandparents were not. And my own father uh, was an only child that struggled, and, and I'll tell you just a, a funny, not really funny, but a, kind of an interesting story that I learned much, much later in life that my father's mother, my paternal grandmother, uh, was basically forced to marry my grandfather. I don't think she loved him. I think she wanted another man. In fact, she even ran away, and her father, my great-grandfather, dragged her back to the altar and she had to marry what ended up being my grandfather. But I don't believe there was any love between the two of them. And my father grew up in that sort of dysfunctional environment, so he didn't know how to love. And therefore, my siblings and I were raised in a, in a – it was like a cycle. A pattern was being repeated. And interestingly enough, my grandmother's father was a Presbyterian minister. You know, but she had uh, had had enough of Christianity. She wanted nothing to do with it, and you can imagine why in her mind. You know, after that, and so I, it's almost as though at somewhere in the family line, where we might have been a family or people of faith, that faith was abandoned and that the curse began. And I don't know if it was with my grandmother or before that, but that's just the way I was analyzing it. If you were to have told them then about fallen angels and aliens, what would they have said? My family or my grandparents? Yes. You know, I have one set of grandparents that would have talked to me with an open mind, and and they were students of the Bible, and they were the people that probably were praying for me and gently encouraging me through that time of, of, I would say, uh, ignorance or darkness when I was young. So I thank God for them. They would have had that discussion with me. I, I've got other members of my family. If I, I mean, I even asked my brother point blank, do you believe in demons? And without hesitation, he said no. Even though he shared the dream with me about the entities, he said no. So there's, there's a cognitive dissonance, and I think we probably try to suppress bad memories, bad feelings, and – you know, that your, your body will remember what the mind forgets, so it can manifest itself through depression. And, and I think um, when, when we get bad enough in a mental state, we're going to be drawn to seek solutions in things like New Age or crystals or uh, some false type of religion or teaching that's going to draw us away from the true source of healing, which I believe is through Jesus Christ. Scott, it's my perception that people are acting strange these days, weird, uptight, not happy. Is something going on here? Yeah, I truly believe it is, George. Um, I think, among other things, the, the, there's certainly the stress of the world changing, and people feel it. They, they know it. And I, I think we're to the point where we're beginning to see the unveiling, the the revealing of this year, with the Pentagon admitting that you know the the um, UAPs the as they call them. Yeah, exactly. The mothership out there, Amuamua. I mean, all of those things are certainly um, adding to the uncertainty. These things, like we were talking about earlier, George, generational curses, sleep paralysis. They've been going on a long time. But even even the the person that would have said I, I saw a flying saucer would have been considered a kook or a conspiracy nut, yeah. tinfoil hat or something, even as early as maybe 10, 15 years ago. Now, there's sort of an explosion of research into this, and we're starting to look at the me- megalithic structures uh, of the ancients. We're starting to have the Pentagon telling us there's a potential threat out there. Uh, they're talking about this so-called mothership, you know. All of this is tied to this agenda. You know, they're trying to prepare a group of humans that think these are benevolent 
ascended masters. Is it uh, a plan underfoot to disguise the aliens as the or, or the fallen angels as aliens? And why disguise it that way? Uh, so we'll be received. So they will be received. In other words, if if there's going to be this war in heaven between angels, and, th- and there's been skirmishes throughout history in the Bible, in the book of Daniel, we know there was an angel named Gabriel that came down to give some words to Daniel, and he was hindered 21 days by what he called the prince of Persia. <clears throat> well, no earthly prince could have held, held an angel back. So, um, And in fact, Michael, the archangel, had to assist Gabriel to get through. So the, the enemy lines are around the earth right now, called the God of this world, and the book of Ephesians describes it as spiritual wickedness in high places. That's become very real to me. Rather than just paying it lip service, I now understand more of what's happening there. So when, when an angel of God comes down, they're crossing through enemy-occupied territory. They're crossing the front lines, and they're coming down. They are... Um, traveling, in my opinion, in these vehicles of conveyance. And and the good angels use them too, by the way. God's angels do travel in the same type of technology that the fallen angels do. So this battle is about to take place in Revelation 12, where these two factions are going to engage in all-out battle. Instead of just skirmishes here and there, it's going to be a war in heaven. And we actually talk about the war in heaven. One of our first episodes, earliest episodes, was the war in heaven. Uh, And in this battle, Lucifer and his angels, or he's called the dragon, and his angels, they are defeated, and they'll be cast down to the earth. Well, they're going to show up. They're not going to admit defeat. They're not going to say, hey, we're the bad guys, and they were ju- we were just expelled out of heaven. They're going to come down in some form of a disguise, and the perfect disguise that would deceive humanity with all its disparate beliefs and religions and faiths to unite and worship one god – uh, and and he, who's a man, a hybrid Nephilim, which is going to be called the beast, they're going to have to have some amazing deception take place. And the perfect deception would be, we're your alien ancestors. We seeded the monkeys millions of years ago, and now you're ready for your next phase of evolution. Right. We're your gods. Yep. And it's the same MO that the serpent, the dragon, uh, and, you know, people think of Adam and Eve in the garden with, a, with an apple tree and a snake. And it wasn't a snake wrapped around a tree. It was a dragon. And whatever it looked like was beautiful. And the temptation was, if you eat this fruit that God forbade you to eat, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. The promise is always knowledge, technology, information. That's what the Occult secret societies want eternal life without God, without God. They think they could do it through technology, also being promised to them by the fallen angels. Scott, this infiltration, is it undergoing right now? Absolutely. You know, George, I know you've got some background in, 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 in a faith and in scriptures, and you probably remember Jesus talking about the parable of the tares in the, among the wheat. Yes. And tares are basically weeds, but they look just like wheat until they are full grown. And so we've always been taught that was, yeah, you know, there'll be wicked people that have evil intentions amongst the the Christians or the believers. But what if the tares is is a metaphor for non-humans? hybrids. They're going to that's what this abduction phenomenon is all about. They're building an army of Nephilim and also to aid in the deception, they're building non-human hybrids that look like humans, tears among the wheat. And they're going to be the ones to say, hey, look at us. We, we look just like you, but we have these special powers. We're evolved. We're, you know, we're closer to being like gods. Um, incidentally, there's a, um, there's a man who's done some tremendous research on this. His name is L.A. Marzulli. I just oh, I know him. L.A. well. Yeah, okay, so of course you do, yeah. Well, L.A. has uh, recently put some pictures of an entity that was caught on a trail cam in Minnesota, and it looks for all the world like an elven, androgynous, Nordic type of entity. Uh, I believe it's a fallen angel. I believe it's real. Uh, there's a there's what looks like an opening portal or, or an orb or something, and then seconds later this thing appears, and it's got the pointed ears. It's dressed in a... And clothing that looks everything like a, 
what you might imagine an angel to wear, a fallen angel in this case. But the really chilling thing is he looks right at the camera. He knows, or he or it knows, it's being seen. It wanted to be seen. And I think that's part of the unveiling. They're starting to make themselves known. They're doing it by degrees because they don't want a war of the worlds type scare thing going on like H.G. Wells or, or Orson Wells did back in the day. Um, but I think they're trying to prepare us for it. And I, by the way, I believe the government's known about this since certainly Roswell, if not 1954, with that contract made between the Greys and Eisenhower. If there was an original war between fallen angels and the good ones, will there be another one? Yeah, that's the one that's coming. Um, and it's going to be a, a final destruction of those angels. Uh, I'm, I think they're going to be cast down to the earth alive, and then they're going to be involving humanity in that final deception because there's a – Everything about the Bible hinges around one particular verse of Scripture, which is Genesis 3.15. After the serpent deceived Eve and she took and ate with her husband Adam, the serpent was cursed by God, and he said that the, I will put enmity, be, enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall crush thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So the seed of the woman is a prophetic statement of, of Christ. Because women don't have seed, they have eggs. So the seed of the woman is an indication of Christ's divinity through through the uh, Immaculate Conception. But the seed of the serpent is a prediction that the Antichrist is going to be the literal child of Lucifer, the dragon, between he and a woman. And, and L.A. believes that entity is alive today. What do you think? I think it's very possible, um, and, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> My theories may be a little bit different, but I see a time factor involved here. There is a verse of Scripture in Second Peter where he wrote that a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And if we take that to be some sort of a prophetic formula, and we take the Bible to be true as we understand the timeline— then Adam would have been created roughly 6,000 years ago. And we're almost at the end of 6,000 years, and the seventh thousand years is about to begin. There's seven days in the week. God created the earth in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. So everything about the rest, the Sabbath, is tied to that seventh day, which, according to the Bible, is a thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. So that's what's coming. Well, there's another passage that's kind of obscure in the book of Hosea, the prophet, where it says in chapter 5, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and their affliction, they will seek me early. And I believe that's a reference to when Christ was rejected by the nation Israel as Messiah, he returned back to the Father. But the very next verse, the next chapter says, it's like Israel, the nation, it's their reply to God where they say, come, let us return to the Lord, for he is stricken and he will heal us. He is smitten and he will bind us up. After two days, we will live in his sight. And so if I apply the formula of two days, Jesus Christ was crucified in A.D. 33. Now, I know we're on a Julian calendar, not a Hebrew calendar, right. but it's been nearly 2,000 years. What if 2033 is the end of the two days, which brings us to the end of the 6,000th year period or the six a day. Who ends up winning this battle, Scott? The winner is going to be the Lord. When Jesus Christ That's, that's returns, good to know. Yeah, he destroys these entities with the spirit of his mouth, with the, with the sword, which is the word of God. They're literally going to melt on their feet when he returns and then he's going to establish a kingdom on this earth that men have been wanting forever, um, which is justice, equity, no more war. They beat the swords into plowshares, uh, spears into pruning hooks. The animal kingdom returns to uh, the condition that it was before sin entered in with the lamb laying down with the lion and all of that. And there'll be no more demons. They're all going to be cast into the lake of fire. So for a thousand years, men are going to be living under a perfect government, and there'll be no excuses. Scott, how did you get interested or involved in this? 
Well, I gotta, I've got to admit that um, there was a man in my church. I was looking into these things and thinking I was crazy, and I was the only one that thought this way. And there was a man in my church that brought me a book one day. He said, Pastor, this is my new favorite book. And it was called The Judgment of the Nephilim by Ryan Peterson. I think he's been on your show as well. Yeah. And when I read that book, I was like, wow, there's somebody else out there that thinks like I do. I thought I was crazy about the giants and all this stuff. And come to find out, he's been one of our one of our best guests uh, <clears throat> and most popular guests. In fact, we just had a um, a summit conference, our first annual debriefing 2023 and Ryan was our keynote speaker, so uh, check him out if you haven't done so. And um, that book, and he's got another one called The Final Nephilim that covers a lot of this as well. But uh, I gotta con- I gotta give him credit for really steering my thinking more towards this. But I've been looking into the Bible for many, many, many years and seeing that there was something different than religion was teaching. Scott, thank you for being on the program. We've got your website linked up at coasttocoastam.com. He's also got BibleMysteriesPodcast.com, where you can hear his regular podcast. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.